I, I am a professor of salutogenesis, actually the first in the world, and I have my little baby. This is the global working group on, on salutogenesis. And uh, I've had a long career. I'm a pediatrician by training and uh, done public health. And actually, reflecting on, on what I'm going to say today, it's an exploration of my own experience of this problem. Understanding from people, dying young people, that there's another story about health. And I'm going to dive into a very specific problem to start with. And uh, let's see now if technology is friendly with me. Um, I place a question to society and uh, if I ever were asked to evaluate a society, I would ask that society, take me to the place where, we have, where you have and keep the mentally retarded. And uh, you can see scenes like this. They were open to me while I was working for a European society for social pediatrics before before the wall came down in Europe and we travelled in Eastern Europe. We saw things like this and uh, even the worst thing I saw were normal children kept in these kind of institutions. They were gypsies or somehow outside, marginalised in, in that society. So I place a very grave uh, statement on society. What are you really doing with these people? Are you actually trying to mobilize and, and bring equity into their life? Starting here uh, with the problem, I'm immediately going to jump to the end of what I'm going to say. I'm going to show you the solution. Because uh, 
the problem is so great that I think you are sad for a long time seeing it. Therefore, I'm going to go into the solution. Now, without music, I'm going to try to talk to these pictures. Uh, this is a little girl. She is a few months old. She was born with Morbus Down, uh, which means that she has a genetic uh, aberration on one, of her, on one of her chromosomes. This means she looks different. It also means that uh, she has a difficulty of understanding abstract things. Traditionally, she would end up in an institution like the one that we saw before. And today, we also have another thing regarding these children. It is, we do test every pregnancy, at least in the part of the world where I live. And a few of these children have been born. Now we have her at the age of four or five. Anna is the name. She's in a shop with her father. I told you she had difficulties in understanding abstract things. But she understands I have to take a number when I queue in, 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 the, in the shop. The father is there communicating with her all the time. And she has her own little shopping wagon. Ah, now it's to her turn. She gives uh, the number to the lady, and the lady says, what do you want? I want ham. How much? Uh, one slice, she says, because numbers is not that. Uh, if you see the lady, she is communicating with, with the father. Now, the father directed the lady back to the child. So he says, let the child speak. Give the child the opportunity. And you can, of course, uh, think about how is it possible? What has happened when we have the children at home and when we have children who are quite able to communicate with, in spite of not understanding abstract things? It was a, 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 a person from learning science who realized one thing. Uh, these children do not understand abstract things. And she understood that language is abstract. All the, what we write and what we say is abstract. So the idea was to create a language which is, which is concrete. Today it's called total pedagogics, which means that from the time the child is born, the child can experience everything around you. Uh, this is uh, a song, a nursery rhyme. Öga, öga, nesa mun, hagor, vegan, nerti brun. Singing makes it easier for these children. They are usually quite musical, so the skill, music and language go together. Which comes first, nobody can say. But the trick here, you will soon discover how and what was the key idea. Because uh, we did have a language which was concrete. And the language is sign language. And by, by learning these children and parents to use sign language, the children all of a sudden have a language early in life and can communicate and can, can be, a, be less marginalized in society. As you can see, uh, this girl who is about three years old, or we should put on sound on this one. John is, uh, is five years old and he knows exactly how a rock star behaves and he's showing his skills here and he's had a day of training and he's pretty pretty tired and uh, he's protesting I've had enough this day I don't want to see these figures anymore and almost falling down on the table and uh, of course he's a male you will see what he's doing when the teacher tries to put it on again, he sits on the chair and what does he do? He puts his feet on the table and he says, I don't want to be in this show anymore. I think if I ever were able to give a Nobel Peace Prize to somebody, I would give it to, to, to the person. Who, in, who invented this. Now, I'm not going to jump further into videos at, that, at this time. The, 
but I want I wanted you to have both perspectives immediately. Uh, the starting point of, of what the real situation is and the possibility and opportunity to, to, to do something in this situation. Okay, now I'll go back and use uh, PowerPoints for a little while. Uh, I'm not very used to PowerPoints because I like to draw and talk, but the time is so short, so I can't really dwell on this. Uh, my entry point is a medical person understanding medicine and the way we think about health and then through the questions to young children, young adults who were on the verge of dying and still told me a different story. They wanted life and talked about life. A girl I, uh, who was dying was, had, a, had a disease, she was, she was close to dying and she said when I met her Bengt, I'm in love, I want to marry, I want to have children. A story we usually don't listen to in, in medicine. Through stories like this, I, I started to discover what is this they are talking about. And they talk, talked about health in a much different way than we did in medicine. So I moved over to public health, then public health promotion came around, and then salutogenesis came around, and was trying to excavate and build these things together. And today I would probably talk about life promotion if I would be talking about anything in this term. Health as such is a def difficult and, uh, and uh, not easy, easy concept and we need to go back and, and tear it apart again. The, today we talk about the well-being part of the concept but maybe, mainly in practice we are still dealing with absence of disease and a risk reduction. And uh, I... I, I, you know, you know, this WHO definition is something like, see now, where are we now? We have disease here, and then you move to, to the other end, contra disease, we could call it, KD. I, I used the, the Swedish uh, abbreviation here, contra disease, and then you have to have a state of complete well-being in a physical. This is so slippery now, so. Uh, uh, mental and so social meaning, which means that only when you are on top of this box up here and fill it out with these three dimensions, you, you have, you have a, 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 a state of well-being, as, as WHO says, this sort of, you fill out the box, and only out here, in the absolute position here, you sit down, it's the position is over there, stable. Up here you have health. And I think this definition is problematic. It's useful, but it's problematic. Uh, also health today does have more dimensions than three. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to do a Leonardo da Vinci here uh, with four arms, you know, when he got the job. Uh, with the Pope, he he made this circle, and and he got the job. Or was it Michelangelo? But Leonardo made this one at least, and uh, and I say health has four dimensions. It was actually mentioned by by Halfdan Mahler, who was the director general of WHO in 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 the 80s when the Ottawa Charter came around, and uh, the, we have the physical dimension which. Doctors and nurses know a lot about. We have the social dimension. In fact, I think we should make it black because you should be painted black. We have the psychological dimension or mental dimension. And then we have the fourth one. And what is the fourth dimension? It is the spiritual, existential, meaningful dimension, which we haven't explored at all today. And I would like to see health move and have all these four concepts in the future together and, and talk about the wholeness like this. Then we can put a smile on the person. So these are the, these are the, these are the sort of dimensions I would like to have into this discussion. Now going back to this slide again, this is where I started, this is how I understood health when I got into this story and then I started to discover. Also in those days, and today also, I think this McKinley River, uh, uh, River is the one we are thinking about. We have learned about health from understanding death and disease. Uh, 
medicine has invented curative approaches, and then we have public health who comes with protection prevention and health education. And all of these thinking terms that health and the concept is developed from understanding death and disease. So the way we think about health is something related to death and disease and, 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 and risks. Again, bringing in something like quality of life, uh, we have a different story. This is a point with you have very little health, you have much, much health. And uh, you usually think like this, if I have a lot of health, I have little disease and I have a lot of quality of life. But in fact, you can move in so many directions. You can have a little health, uh, a little disease, and a lot of quality of life. You can have uh, a lot of health, a lot of disease, and a lot of quality of life. And my thought is, what can health promotion in a structural way do with this? And how could salutogenesis contribute to this? I'm allowed to say salutogenesis, do I? You said I couldn't sort of use it as a main theme. I'm not going to use that. But, but, but understand that this is much more relative than we usually think about, depending on how we define this concept. And the good thing about health promotion is that we move from a state to a process. And uh, you know the Ottawa Charter. You know it like the genetic code of health promotion. I have to work with genetic people in Finland. I was there seven years before I moved to Norway. And I, just to make them think in terms like this, I said, health promotion is the process which enables people to gain control over their health determinants, thereby improving their health in order to lead an active and productive life. Voila, we have the genetic code. And it's just as much nonsense as the genetic code of the human being, unless you can interpret this. And I think we who have worked in health promotion have been pretty bad at this, the embedded principles and values of health promotion. We have the action areas, which everybody knows, and which, where we, which we do a lot of with. We should work with them all together, I think, not only the single one, and then we have the description of health promotion. Health promotion uh, is the process, a uh, lifelong process, where we learn what health determinants we had, what life experience we have, we collect it in a rucksack, life rucksack, and we move on in life. And we have to solve problems. We try to look in the rucksack. If we don't find it there, we ask the people or the context around ourselves, and then we move forward. And we try to lead an active and productive life, a good life, or what I would say, a, a have a good quality of life. There's also some writings on the T-shirt here, yeah. HR, human rights. It's all about human rights. The core of health promotion, the core of public health is human rights. We have forgotten it completely. And it's really important to come back and think about people as active, participating subjects. Think about the two videos I've shown. The first one, active participating subjects. When you're automatic, you don't do it. You have no control of your life. And then the little girl who had moved on, who had got something on the way. The river, again, it's still there, and probably most people think about it in this way. Uh, but we should actually think in two directions. This is the classic way. From death, disease, risk, we understand health. But what about looking at health in the direction of life, as the Ottawa Charter tries to do? Exp explore the determinants of well-being, what creates health and well-being, and make the river a different river, a river that flows in the direction of life. It flows in this direction. I had to put a waterfall on, the car, on the here, because I can never guarantee that you would you wouldn't end up with trouble here. You can every time. Life is so unpredictable. I can say you are completely healthy and the next minute you're dead. And, and so I am saying this is much more relevant. But looking at health in the direction of, of, of life and looking at what resources we have. Now resources and risks are interesting concepts. Usually we have a short term perspective on this when we work with this. And, you know, you, you have a risk, you end up with a negative experience, but over time, experiencing a risk can become a resource. And a resource uh, can become a risk. So this is much more relative than, than, than we think about usually, if we put it in the life or a, a long-term perspective. Okay, 
This river is something that came out of discussions within, the, within my group in Helsinki, and we've used this, and it's pretty good. I don't go into details with this. You see something on the side here, which is, which is actually Antonovsky's way of describing uh, health as an, a state of ease, and, and, and upset state, which you call this is a bit problematic use that word, and saying that all of us are somewhere on this curve, and we, we should try to move in this direction, into the direction of salutogenesis in our life. We also got a very bad, nasty critique from Michael Marmot in, in, in Nairobi, the World well, Health Organization, at the meeting on health promotion. And he said, it's not a question of health promotion, not having the right approach to improve health of the population, reducing inequity in health. It's all there in our principles, but it's rather a question of the professionals in health promotion not doing what they are supposed to do. And that's pretty tough. And I think it's there, and I think it's correct to say this. If you want to see what he says and an interview about social determinants, go and have a look at YouTube and have this one. I don't have time to spell this, but you can, you can actually find it that easy. Now I go into this long story about building up, building up uh, assets and resources. We start with building up, understanding the welfare society by understanding standards of living. In the 50s we start defining these things. And today, when we look at indexes, this is actually a dialogue from Scandinavia to, to, to Canada. If you look at the countries, the top countries in all, I think human, the Human Development Index has, has, uh, has inequity measures. This is their inequity adjusted human development index. And if you look at this, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, and Denmark, and Finland is there, Canada comes underneath. Uh, 20 years ago, Canada was number one for five years. And then Norway and Australia moved up. And now Norway has been there for a long time. And it's going to stay there for a long time, I tell you. Again, uh, the, another index which was new to me is combining wealth and well-being into prosperity. And this is a Legatum Prosperity Index, you can find it on, on, on the internet also, where they have combined many of these indexes and use all these, these, these indicators to try to describe uh, prosperity, uh, wealth and well-being. And uh, again, looking at the ranking, what countries do we find here? This time Canada has surpassed Finland. Boo, boo, boo. Okay. But, but uh, as you, and you think about Canada, it's about 30 million people, 25 million people. 25. Scandinavia altogether is 25, 27 million. We are talking about similar populations in numbers and similar climate and so on. There are much to connect this. And then you can always start thinking about why is it like this. My story coming from medicine uh, into, into public health and into sociology. I had to learn about the welfare society and, and, and the first one done as a comparative study, where I also use quality of life, was, was a Scandinavian one calling having, loving and being. And uh, here you see the model and this is the first time we were using both objective and subjective indicator, which would be natural today. Having a standard of living, uh, talking about material and impersonal things, loving and being is more a question of quality of life, talking about relationships and so on. Uh, Eric Allard said he forgot doing what people do every day because work is much more important than he thought at the time being. Uh, there's a better model. This was a static model, like the WHO model. There's a better model, Harald Sverner, who's a social, in social work, one of the first ones to make it a science. He had a model called take, have, and give, saying that you have an arena. Maybe I should do it if I, if I do have the time. I, I can make it wrong. You have a resource arena around yourself. And then you have a resource arena in society around yourself where you can, from your own resource arena, you can take, you have and you te can take from, from that resource arena. But he also says, unless you are able to give, you, d you will not have a good quality of life. So he talks about three resource arenas and the transference between these arenas. Oh. Uh, I can't really see where I am, but this is sort of, you have a transference of, of, between this. 
take, have and give. And this reminds me very much of, of the Canadian model that came uh, when we were studying, uh, studying uh, disability in society, it, it was the being, belonging and becoming idea, also a dynamic idea. I think these models are something that we should look at. What am I actually trying to find here? I'm, to, I'm trying to find a process as an indicator of, 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 of dealing with issues like, like, uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, inequity. And this is what I'm trying to explore. What I did, I, I wrote my thesis on quality of life comparing five, the five Nordic countries and now I've drawn on that one, I need, I need some more space here, I can pull the trigger, oh, go up, yes. Uh, I tried to look at children and quality of life in the four, in five Nordic countries, we had a big study of 15,000 families and trying to talk about uh, four spheres of life which were important for children. Uh, first we have the personal one. I don't know why I don't see this. I have to, yeah, I got it. The personal sphere is called, it's about the physical, uh, it's about the mental and spiritual st uh, the, uh, 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 parts of, of life. Then we have the, the interpersonal which was about uh, uh, f about family relationships, both, both the, 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 the structure and the function of it. Then we have the th third one, which we call the external, which is a, about the, 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 uh, the econo economy, uh, the education and so on of the family. And then the global one, which is about how does society look, look at children in society. I should put the father in here, also father is quite important, he's hiding behind there. Okay, now we have the whole family here, and the child can smile again, standing here. The, these four dimensions, the four spheres of life we were using, it became a big model. And the interesting thing about this, we were comparing ordinary families and families with children with disabilities. The big finding was, in Scandinavia, children with disabled, families with disabled children have the same opportunities as as, as other families, same economy, same ed training, same education, same same living conditions, and so on, which was a thing I almost missed because it was it was the same. There was no different difference between the ordinary and so on. And this is, was in fact the big thing that we had been able at that time. This is the uh, in the 90s, middle of 90s, we had actually constructed a welfare society that supported so well that you had the same, same opportunities even if you had a disabled child. Uh, and of course it falls back on the long tradition of the Venter society. There was one dimension which was different and that was the mental dimension. The families uh, uh, found, thought that the children were not doing as well mentally as the other children. Therefore I started exploring the mental dimension from this and uh, moved on. And there I find some historical important thing when we talk about positive mental health. Yahuda in 1958 had a model where she has a very personal psychological dimension and then my big favorite, Siri Ness in Norway, who talked about inner quality of life as mental health to be active, having self-esteem, good interpersonal relationship, and a basic mood of joy as the core of this. Uh, I jump away again. We have a model, we have some thinking, and think about these two images I showed on the video before. Where do you find this, this sort of thing? What I liked extre extremely well was the word joy here, compared to, to the, the happiness. Joy is, is a is, uh, is, is something that goes on over time, while happiness comes and happiness goes. It's a much better concept, basic mood of joy, and, and, and open a lot for me in my thinking. Again, now I'll jump into sociology again. We have a concept which is very much used in the health sector, social capital. And I think Margaret Whitehead had been here, she worked with Finn Diderikson, and they talked about two dimensions of, of social capital, horizontal and, and vertical. 
horizontal is about human relationships in terms of very many many things around the person and well-being and self-esteem something like what I said about quality the vertical is how you as an individual uh, connects with the near sphere let's say the family connects with neighborhood and connects so on with the city and the whole society a bit like the quality of life model I had uh, we have another concept, much less explored this year. This is the cultural capital, which I actually personally believe can be much more important and much more uh, decisive in this discussion. And then I've written with small, small, small writers there, uh, salutogenesis and sense of coherence and Antonovsky. Actually, salutogenesis works between these two and creates both horizontal and vertical capital at the same time. Interesting. Hmm. Do we have a potential for something new here? Again, going back to the second video and thinking about learning, which I think health is a learning process. Can we create learning process which do not differentiate out the weak ones and the strong ones? Uh, basically, school has a non-differentiated learning model, which actually is, can be very destructive to families and children who do not have school intelligence, do not have the learning culture to do well in schools because the tradition is there. And unwillingly schools can actually uh, increase social and health differences. We have Michael Rutter, who is a uh, child psychiatrist, not, do not be, and Nielsen, who is, a, who is a, a, from learning science, all saying the same thing. The other way is to ask to start with in-depth learning as I said, with the little part of this girl with Morgus Down, just learning to communicate and learning language, but it's a much deeper and much more interesting dimension where you actually use all the dimensions of intelligence. How many intelligences are there? Eight intelligences, I think we measure now today. Gardner has written about it. It's an interesting, interesting way. And all these are important for the wholeness. Again, another hero in this story is, for me, Paolo Freire, who, who, who challenged the world and his society uh, in Brazil by starting teaching uh, the uneducated uh, to, to learn, to write, and, 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 and you needed, to, needed literacy to be able to vote in presidential election in, in Brazil. And he was so skillful that the government became scared of him and they threw him out of the country. So he spent a lot of his life outside, outside Brazil because this was too dangerous. It was too effective. But I think empowerment in terms of Paulo Freire as a learning process would be really something that we should put much more emphasis on when we talk about uh, changing society and, and, and doing things. And now, moving from horizontal and vertical capital over power of Freire and empowerment, I can actually go down into where I am today to try to find a solution. And then I would talk about salutogenesis and healthy learning. Not health learning, but healthy learning. A process which actually creates health, a learning process, a lifelong learning process. Again, not going deep into, into sense of coherence and the salutogenic concept of Antonovsky, uh, it acts on the psycho-emotional level but connects, connects, as I said, vertical and, and, and horizontal social capital into a structure and not much less on the socio-economic. I think we in health right now are too much involved with this, only the social dimension. We should actually have all four dimensions of health when we talk of, about determinants of health. But maybe that's the next step in this, in this discussion. But we have pretty good evidence that this should be working. Also, the learning process has to be, be made better. This is more about from learning science. I'm not going to dwell on this one. And, and we, we are actually into this kind of learning also today. I would like, I think, at this point, to, to just demonstrate another Scandinavian story. This is a friend of mine who is, at the time this is made, she's, she's 19 years old. She was born without arms and legs, and she somehow demonstrates this uh, interaction between individual uh, 
the near uh, social context and societal context. You can think about uh, how come this girl is so skillful like this. Is it because she's a, she's a superhuman being? Or is it because uh, she had a family who said, Lena Maria, you are our child and you are a challenge to us and we will do everything to make life worthwhile for you. Or is it because she was born into a society, a welfare society, who had been working for 50, 60 years to make conditions equal for everybody born in the society? Uh, when she explains her, her life, she says, I grew up as an ordinary child. Uh, there was nobody. Uh, uh, I was, my life was no different from my brother. Brother, he, I was an ordinary child. I got no sort of fa favors because I was like this. She also said that when she went to school, they wanted her to have an assistant, you know, a person helping her. And in one week's time, she had arranged so that the, this person helped the dean to sort out papers so Lena Maria could do her own things in the school. And this is the way he has, she has been thinking all the time. And again, how come you can become this skillful? And I think, talking about her and seeing her, it is about... Uh, one of the few syntheses is when the individual and the social context and society work together. And it's interesting, I talked about human rights in the beginning and I mentioned the Declaration of Human Rights, but if you look at the modern version of human rights uh, of the, of the, on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, you have a different story. It's no longer a story about the individual, it's a story about the child in its context, in the family and in society. So we actually have a, an instrument in, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child we could use much more. I'm presently using an analysis in, in, in Sweden about how this works compared to salutogenic thinking. Lena Maria at the age of 19, of course, she wants to look at as any other teenager and make herself pretty and, 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 and uh, put mascara on and so on. I don't know the names of these things that you put on. Well, I have a daughter. She, she, she managed herself. I didn't have to do that for her. But sitting here, living on her own at the age of 19, going to, an, to a gymnasium, a special gymnasium, because she has a skill, she, she mm -hmm. sings well. So she wanted to become uh, a vocalist, and actually now I know she's over 40 years old today. She's an international vocalist, she travels around the world and sings. Uh, I'm not going to jump too far into this story, but let us, let us just see the next step in this film and think about the context and wholeness which we can have around a person. A kitchen. She needs nothing but this chair to sit on when she works and maneuvers there. And uh, oh, she demonstrates at the night, age of 19, you, you also want to show you can do everything. And she does everything. And again, doing and controlling your, your ordinary life. Here she says, well, it would be good to have arms. Then I could do two sweaters at the same time. But on the other hand, I'm born like this. I don't want to be anybody else. This is me. I would never want to be anybody but myself. Of course, and also this is a thing that, that people also uh, many times react to. Well, who needs transportation, mechanical transportation, if not a person who, who has a, 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 a mobile disability? She has difficulty to walk long, long, long. Time. Okay, we can put some music on it. If somebody asks me what the quality of life is, it, I say it's going to be able to drum with your big toe on the, on the driving. driving. 
But this is a person who has been a symbol for me. She's been with me for since she was 19, for over 20 years, and she has been the inspiration. I can always go back to her when I start thinking that science is too complicated, and then, then I can see clearer again for a long time. But I wanted to, to put, set up this scene for you today, seeing the problem, seeing the opportunity. I could, of course, end up with some comments about what we can achieve with, uh, with, with salutogenesis. In fact, if you look at, at what we wanted to achieve with the health for all policy, we can actually achieve all these, all these goals that were, were, were intended to it, especially when it comes to well-being and mental health and quality of life. And I think we should, in the future, try to think about a synthesis between medicine, public health, health promotion, all the other disciplines, to something which would be next health. Again, I'm not sure I want to call it health because health is so dominated by people with my profession. I would like to, maybe we should have another word there. And this is the model we, we developed in the the European Health Promotion Indicator Group, which it combines both the positive health and ill health risk and resources. And we need all to do this. And I want to end this with a statement from the United States. Now you can't see all the colors. This is election day, November 6th in Chicago. A little girl uh, of, 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 uh, of, uh, from, uh, from not a dominating group celebrating that her president is back. Thank you. I will end with this. Thank you.